The use of digital technology in the visual arts has opened up new opportunities and possibilities for artists to explore their creativity and reach new audiences. Digital tools and software offer techniques that are not possible with traditional art mediums, allowing artists to work more quickly and efficiently. They allow artists to experiment with different ideas and concepts. Digital technology has also made it possible for artists to reach wider audiences through the internet and social media. Through the Victorian curriculum, students are engaged in experimentation and problem solving relevant to visual perception and language. They use visual techniques, technologies, practices and processes in their artworks. Such technologies are helping to bring new creativity and engagement to visual arts education and are preparing students for future careers in the creative industries. In this module, we will explore how students can gain an awareness of the different digital technologies available for them to use when creating their art. We will also look at how programmable electronics can be incorporated into the visual arts classroom and view examples of classroom-friendly electronics and coding activities to make simple art pieces. One of the reasons why I think digital technologies and the visual arts make such a good partnership um, is that it facilitates a really interesting context for the students to learn coding um, and programmable parts of physical computing um, in a really interesting way, in a, a way that is quite meaningful to them. So if they're, say, progr programming an RGB light, um, they're learning about values of the red, the blue and the green, um, and they're seeing a direct result of the coding that they're doing. Uh, another one is that um, visual arts just isn't a purely uh, painting or drawing field anymore. We're seeing a much bigger rise in uh, artworks that engage our participants um, and cause them to have um, maybe immersive experiences uh, and interactive ones that they come away with a heightened sense of what it means to be a human being. So um, by introducing students to these types of things at an earlier age, uh, it better sets them up for a wider range of possibilities for themselves as creatives uh, further along the track. So it helps to broaden their um, exposures and sort of get them excited about different ways that we can create uh, experiences and artworks uh, that supersede the human experience. Uh, and I guess it's off that, uh, it really just allows them to have a wider range of um, expressive tools. So um, going beyond say an art room of paint and um, paper and printmaking and all of the other possibilities there, um, they start to see and think about things um, that can come alive um, that people might um, interact with. However, once you start stepping into this realm of interactive and immersive artworks, uh, it really provokes the students to start thinking about how the participant might interact with that artwork, uh, what kind of concept they're really wanting the person to come away with, um, and then how they might create a bit of function within the artwork to do that. It also allows uh, students to, I guess, um, explore wider the elements within the visual arts, things such as light, sound and movement. Um, and with the introduction of these elements, um, they can explore, like, I guess, more complex concepts uh, with the thought of like how the artwork might function. Uh, and this is, might be something that's not often experienced for students within traditional approaches to art. The use of programmable electronics in the visual arts classroom refers to the use of digital tools such as microcontrollers, sensors, LEDs, motors and other electronic devices that can be programmed using software tools. Inspired by the works of professional artists, these tools allow students to create programmed, interactive and kinetic art installations. Um, one of the projects I did was in response to Yayo Kusama, and this was using a, a um, shoebox. So you can create like an, an infinity space within that using reflective materials um, and then set things up within that. 
So uh, with the use of micro bits, you can set up um, RGB lights and use motors uh, to be able to kind of create a bit of motion within that. Um, and then the lighting um, programming and something that's got a sequence within it. Probably my number one recommendation is um, empower the experts. So uh, really work with your class um, or classes uh, to build up a culture of, uh, I guess, knowledge sharing. Uh, one of the ways you can do this is um, just getting in the habit of when students come to you with a, a problem, um, just announcing to the group who knows how to do dot, dot, dot. Um, and then allowing the students that do have that knowledge to come forth. Uh, it's incredible with these type of things where um, students might have hobbies or out of school interests uh, that allow them to really build up this knowledge that kind of sits on a shelf um, a lot of the time at school. So you'll find students that may previously not really engage really come alive and um, share and feel really empowered within the learning community. Uh, another recommendation I'd make would be um, invest uh, wisely with your technology. Uh, I spent a lot of money in my years, um, some on technology that just didn't quite stand up to um, heavy-handed students, we'll call it. Make sure you make time for yourself uh, to have a play and experience the technology yourself. So uh, this might be taking it home over a weekend or a couple of nights uh, to have a play with it yourself. Um, this will be great for you to experience the joy, the curiosities, uh, the frustrations, and I guess the, the ways to be able to problem solve around it. Uh, uh, last thing I'd probably leave you with is uh, also uh, thinking about the design thinking process. So giving students a real good structure around um, approaching and achieving success uh, when using the technology.